Welcome to the virtual Scandinavia House in New York and to this third of our Nordic literature panels, Authors You Should Know, with this week's focus on Finnish literature with Celia Ahava, Rosa Lixholm, Johanna Sinasalo, and Antti Toimaninen, and moderated by the translator Lola Rogers. Um, as I already mentioned, this is the third of seven panels that we will be exploring. Uh, and next week, we will be visiting the Faroe Islands with the translator Carrie Price Pierce. Support for this event has been graciously provided by Feely, uh, Finnish Literature Abroad, and media support has been provided by, for the series has been provided by the journal Europe Now, published by the Council of European Studies at Columbia University. Lola Rogers is a full-time literary translator living in Seattle. She has translated 13 novels, as well as children's books, comics, short stories, and poetry. Lola's translations Lola's translation of Sophia Oxenden's novel When Doves Disappears was the finalist for the 2016 Oxford Wittenfield Translation Prize, and her tr translation for Johanna Sinasalo's The Core of the Sun has received the 2017 Prometheus Award. Lola has awarded the National Endowment for Arts in 2019 Translation Fellowship for her translation of Death of I. Ovar Klein by Daniel Katz, for which is now seeking a publisher. So please welcome Lola. And let me unmute you quickly. Oops, unmute you, sorry. Okay, please welcome Lola. Hello, and welcome. Uh, today we have the honor of talking with four Finnish writers whose works are very diverse, uh, but who also have more in common than a brief description of their work might lead you to believe. They, they have all written books that are humane and thoughtful, uh, books uh, that ask interesting existential and moral questions about our place as humans in society and, and in nature. And uh, we'll begin uh, by talking with Celia Ahaba. Uh, Celia Ahaba writes fiction that explores difficult universal questions. Her books ask how we can make a meaningful story of our lives and the world when they are so subject to random chance. Her skill and insight as a writer brought her international attention from her first published novel and her second novel, Things That Fall From the Sky, won the European Union Prize in 2016 and has been translated into more than 20 languages. It was published in English by One World Publishing in 2019. Uh, Celia Ahava will be talking today about her newest book, The Woman Who Loved Insects. And this book is interesting. It's an interesting combination of things. It's the story of a scientific mind, but it also has a bit of magic in it as well in its timeline. And uh, Celia, the book is based on the life of a real person, right? Yes, I'll, I'll show you the book. It, uh -huh. It's here, it's only come out and finished this August. So here it is. Uh, it's based on a German um, female naturalist. Sci they didn't have scientists <laughs> yet at that point, an artist called Maria Sibulla Merian. Um, she was born in 1647 and she was um, quite exceptional woman. Um, interested in insects. She was the first person who documented all the four stages, meta metamorphosis process of butterfly um, in a time when there was still very little known about insects. And um, so that's the real life base for, for the story. Although Maria in my book um, continues living um, so she metamorphoses is into a fictional character and, and um, extends her lifespan into 370 years. So she dies in contemporary day Berlin. And between <laughs> the, this beginning and ending, she spends the 1800s in Japan. That has a very interesting and unique um, insect culture. Um, and also the book, deals with more generally with man and man's or woman's relationship with nature and God and how those relationships change during the centuries. Um, 
so there, there's Darwin and um, the whole evolution theory and how that affected how we perceive the world and the, the stability and the change and all these um, big um, ideas about life and what's what's um, eternal and fixed and what is changing and in a flow. Yes, and it talks about them in an interesting way because it talks about them through the mind of one uh, thinker, one person's mm. thoughts about uh, these changes, which is very interesting. Uh, her life, the way a person mm. changes over their life, uh, yeah. in her case lasts for centuries. And so that's very interesting. Yes. And there's a, through the whole book, there's this question of, of um, especially woman's right to have her own voice and uh, being heard um, and, and right to exist um, as, a, as a speaker and thinker and as a body as well. And how different centuries have questioned that right um, and in some ways still do. Mm -hmm. So shall we read from this uh, yes. book? So this is the very beginning of the book um, uh, taking place in the coral reefs in Japan. I'll just do a short paragraph in Finnish and Lola will continue then. Koralliriutta kiertyy värikkäänä helmana saaren ympärillä. Se avaa poimuihinsa ihmeellisen maailman, jossa levät Ravut, simpukat ja polyypit, planktonit, kalat, meritähdet ja meduusat syövät ja ruokkivat toisiaan. Koralli kasvaa monissa muodoissaan, huojuu lonkeroina meren virrasta ja kukkii tukevana kuin kaalinpää. Kiipeää ja kuolee ja kivettyy, jauhautuu kalkiksi, kasvaa kuolleen itsensä raunioille ja kilpikonnat nousevat merestä sen luiseen rantahiekkaan munimaan. And this is in a translation by Fleur Jeremiah of The Woman Who Loved Insects. The coral reef wraps itself round the island like a colorful skirt. It unveils a wonderful world inside its folds where seaweed, crayfish, mussels and polyps, plankton, fish, starfish and medusas eat and feed each other. Coral grows in its myriad forms, sways like tentacles in the sea current and brings forth flowers sturdy as cabbage heads climbs, dies, and opalizes, becomes chalk powder, grows on the ruins of its dead self with turtles rising from the sea to its sandy beach of bone meal to lay eggs. When coral spawns something it does once a year at full moon, its surface comes up in vesicles. It's as if a shiver of love had traveled through the reef and raised goose pimples on its skin, or a fever had made its folds throb. I'm standing in the shallows, observing this period of pregnancy as the island underneath me comes to life. I am not a plant, but an animal, it reminds me. The bone meal crackles under my footsteps. A giant mussel the size of a travel trunk lies in the depths. And when it slowly closes its lid, a long jet of water erupts from the corner of its mouth. The dark wing beats of a manta ray touch the surface of the reef and the golden flanks of the butterfly fish and the blue sparkling sapphire fish twinkle in the folds like flowers let loose from their stalks. The world's liquids still hold secrets hidden from humans. The night after the full moon follows and the vesicles of the coral burst. Both ova and sperm spurt from inside each vesicle to float in the water to seek out each other and so the sea is momentarily filled with pearly nuggets, like a snowfall rising from earth to heaven, like stardust floating from the sand of the sea towards the moon, like hermaphrodite sperm illuminated by the wan light of the moon. The world becomes fertilized around my feet and a starry sky opens above my head. The moon glints on the surface of the sea and the white sand of the beach and dims the furthermost stars to make them disappear into the stratosphere. I am far away from everything. In this landscape, a human being is insignificant, as insignificant as all the other small species we didn't get around to even noticing. And this landscape right now is the one that we shall lose first. I was born during an April night. I was my mother's first and my father's ninth child. As is common for all births in nature, 
My birth was intertwined with the deaths of many others. My father's first wife died two years previously. The death of my little brother born after me made, my mother's, made me my mother's only child. And soon after my fifth birthday, my own father also passed away. I don't remember a great deal about my father and I didn't truly understand his departure because his death happened far away and reached our house in the form of a mere scrap of paper. The few images of my father that stick in my mind have been enlarged and colored by my memory so that they glow with a special light and maybe no one else would recognize them as true. I remember my father's hands best. Father's knuckles stuck out and rose from the backs of his hands like four hills and the surface of his palms was surprisingly soft, almost as if these hands had never done any work. But my father did work, and I was often allowed to sit on the floor of the printing press while my father and my half-brothers labored. The sheets of paper hung on the ceiling swayed above me like laundered sheets. They were that big and blinding in their whiteness, and the experience stays in my memory. When I recall my father's hands, I remember the tempo and temperament of his movements, and envisioned the solemnity with which he picked up a damp sheet of paper and placed it on the leather bed of the printing press. When I later watched my brother Casper at the same task, I imagined my father in his place and wondered if my father's hand had moved across the sheet like that with the same care and assurance. And when Casper rubbed ink into the printing plate, I recognized the viscous sound emitted by the inky sponges and I knew I had observed this process many times. I had been able to witness when still small, how things could be hidden from our vision as the press sank onto the paper and opened up as something new and a sheet decorated by text and pictures emerged and was picked up by father's fingers. It was two pages of a finished book. And although the same thing was repeated hundreds of times a day, the change concealed from our eyes, the hiding and the birth was always a miracle to me. <laughs> it's a lovely passage from the beginning of the book. And now, without further ado, uh, let's move on and talk with Antti Tuomainen. Uh, Antti Tuomainen has written thoughtful and suspenseful crime novels and for the past several years, delightful comic crime novels that have received considerable attention in the UK, but are not as yet as well known in the US. His work is sometimes lyrical and heartfelt, sometimes hilarious, and sometimes both at the same time. And I think that the decency and ethical awareness of the protagonists of his novels are refreshing in crime fiction. His books have been published in 27 countries and have appeared regularly in English uh, for the past decade. So uh, welcome, Antti Tuomainen. Thank you, Lola. Wonderful <laughs> to be here. Wonderful to see you. So your first uh, novels uh, were crime novels. You've been a crime uh, novel writer from the beginning. Uh, and they also, uh, they explored serious uh, themes, uh, especially environmental themes. Uh, so, books about uh, climate change, books that dealt with environmental disaster. And uh, while your books always had humor in them, uh, lately they've become a lot funnier. And- Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and um, the book you're uh, planning to read from today is The Man Who Died, which was published by Orenda Books. And this was uh, one of the first novels to sort of have a distinctly humorous edge, although it's very grim in its humor, uh, but it's funny. So uh, how did that happen in your writing? How did you decide to, to write books that will make me laugh? Uh, to put it in a nutshell, I think what happened that after writing five very dark and very serious crime novels, I, 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 I just felt that I needed to do something different, but it was also um, a very much an inner need because I've always had um, two, two interests in arts, uh, um, especially two strong interests. And, and one of them has been um, 
I would say, Anglo-American noir literature. And the other has been comedies. Everything from the old Marx Brothers to Bridesmaids. I love comedies. And so at, at that time, this was maybe five years ago, I just felt that I needed to bring that element into my writing. It was just something I had to do. I had no, I had no uh, recipe or I, I didn't have anything that I knew was going to be funny. And I remember telling my agent that, you know, uh, after writing these very serious books, I'm going to try something funny. And I remember he said, interesting. And I, because it, it, it was just something that I felt that I needed to do, but I didn't have a plan at the time. Uh, but I just started writing what became The Man Who Died. And that's the book I'm going to read from today. And it's, it's an important book because it was the first one of these black humor books that I did. And it's sort of turned a new leaf in my authorship and it's been an interesting turn it and it's 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 been something that I wanted to do I realized in hindsight that I needed to do also mm -hmm. well uh let's uh move right on to the reading then this is a book I wanted to uh maybe just orient people tell them a little bit about what the book is about um before the reading I don't know what portion of the book you're wanting to read from uh, well, to put it in context, uh, The Man Who Died is a um, <laughs> is, is what I hope it is. It, it, it's a funny and warm book about death and dying. Um, and it's, it, 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 the premise is very simple. Uh, it, the main character is... Um, Jaakko Kaunismaa, a 37-year-old Finnish man who is also a mushroom entrepreneur. One day he goes to the doctor and finds out somebody's been poisoning him over a very long time. And he goes home to tell his wife and um, surprises his wife having uh, intimate relations with um, with another man. So his day is off to a very rocky start and it gets worse from then on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I will read, um, this is fairly early in the book where um, Jaakko is still trying to come to terms with what's happening around him and, and you know, just make sense of the situation. And both of my readings, I have to mention this, are very, very short, both in Finnish and in English. And I'll do the English myself as well, so please bear with me. Okay, here's the Finnish one. Olen selvinnyt työstä. Olen löytänyt itsestäni ihmeellisiä voimia. Olen maannut valveilla Tainan vieressä syyttämättä häntä murhastani. Siihen tulen tarvitsemaan todisteita. Olen kyönyt juomaan litran hunajalla vahvistettua AB-jugurttia keskiyön ja aamukuuden välillä ja olen pohtinut tilannettani seuraavia mahdollisia askeleitani. Ja sanottakoon kuolemasta mitä tahansa, sen hoikentavaa vaikutusta ei sovi vähätellä. Uimahousut, jotka vielä alkukesästä puristivat lanteitani ja nivusiani tyrää luvaten, ovat pakollisen paaston ansiosta muuttuneet mukaviksi. Tämä on tietysti tilapäistä, mutta kuten nyt tiedän, sitä elämäkin on. Okay, now I will do the English one so people will find out what I've been saying. Okay. I have survived the night. I have found powers I never knew I had. I lay awake next to Taina without accusing her of murdering me, I'm going to need some evidence first. I managed to down a liter of honey-flavored acidophilus yogurt between midnight and 6 a.m., and I have pondered my situation, considering my possible next steps. And you can say what you like about death, but its slimming effect 
is not to be underestimated. The swimming trunks, which pinched my hips at the beginning of summer and were so tight round my groin that they could have given me a hernia, now sit nicely thanks to the fasting regime I instituted at dinner last night. Of course, this is only temporary, but as I now know, so is life. That's great. And that's uh, David Haxton's translation. It is. It's an excellent translation. It is. It is. It's great fun. Okay, so you had a very short reading for us. We're going to move right along uh, to uh, our next guest, Johanna Sini Salo. And uh, hello. <laughs> uh, Johanna Sini Salo is among Finland's most widely translated authors with works published in more than 20 languages. She originated the concept of Finnish weird, that previously unclassifiable mix of realism, surrealism, magic realism, and speculative fiction that characterizes many Finnish writers' work. She is famous for incorporating found texts into her work and for writing stories that invite multiple thought-provoking interpretations. Her writing has won numerous awards in Finland and in English translation. And her novel Troll was the first work classified as speculative fiction to be awarded the Finlandia Prize, Finland's most prestigious literary award. So today uh, we're going to be talking about your newest novel, Strangers Inside. Uh, and this is a story of a contemporary and in many ways very ordinary family where something strange and perhaps sinister is happening. So can you tell us a bit about this family? Sure. Um, this is the cover of the Finnish edition. And uh, this book um, was published in Finnish uh, last spring and it won a major domestic uh, horror novel competition. So uh, this is uh, my first try on the uh, on the uh, genre of horror. Of course, my, my previous books has all, also have had some uh, horror-like elements in them, but this is, this is uh, as you said, a uh, very modern, very contemporary horror story. Uh, it has very uh, everyday locations, everyday uh, characters, and, uh, and it also has a dash of latest science in it. And I think it could be defined the best uh, as body horror or biological horror. Uh, but basically it's uh, about how little we actually know about ourselves as uh, biological creatures and uh, as, as a species. So, um, uh, and also this book is about uh, how little we know about each other, even, even those people who are uh, living the closest with you. So um, this is a book about, uh, also a book about family din dynamics and power structures and uh, the shifts of the power balance in, in, inside family. Uh, and of course, there is a very uh, precocious little girl as one, one of the, the main characters. Uh, I think this is also a book about how we very often underestimate children. And uh, this, uh, my child protagonist uh, says, says very often, the adults do not always have to know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then in this book, uh, the, the biological horror, I hadn't heard that term before, but that's very, uh, very apt. It, this is something you've done in many of your stories and it happens in this book too where it is ambiguous um, what is causing these strange things to happen. It could be something biological, uh, it, you know, uh, could be a physiological process happening inside uh, their body. It could be a psychological process mm -hmm. right. uh, or it could be something supernatural or it could be all of those things. And uh, so that it, it sort of, uh, your, your mind expands as you read with the possible explanations for what's going on. And this is something you've done in a lot of your stories. Is it something, I'm wondering if this is something that happens, 
that you consciously plan as you write, or is it something that just happens as you as you write as you wrote this book? Uh, yeah, I I have always loved this kind of stories that you can uh, you can interpret in very many different ways, and and they all are as uh, correct ways or yeah. as incorrect ways to do yeah. that. <laughs> Why don't we jump right in and read then? Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Nyt. Nyt taas se tapahtuu. Mihin sinä menet, Luukas? Miksi yhtäkkiä touhukas pikku olemuksesi syöttötuolissa ikään kuin unohtaa, mitä oli tekemässä? Katseesi ei etsi tuttuja esineitä. Pää ei kääntyy silmien ohjauksessa. Ikiliikkuja sormet eivät tavoittele nokkamukia tai lusikkaa tai ruokalopun reunaa. Heilautan kättäni näkökentässäsi. Hei, et reagoi. Taputan käsiäni yhteen, mutta et hätkähdä. Et edes käännä katsettasi äänen suuntaan. Mihin sinä katoat pikkuiseni? Nyt. Nyt olet taas täällä. Jalka heilahtaa, silmät siristyvät ja kun virnistän sinulle, virnistät vastaan ja taputat riemuissasi pieniä kaurapuuroisia käsiäsi syöttöktuolin etukaiteeseen. Vedän syvään henkeä. Nyt rauhallisesti. Tuohan voi olla ihan vain aisteiltaan koko ajan kehittyvän lapsen huomioon yhtäkkistä kiinnittymistä johonkin, mitä aikuinen ei osaa ajatella keskittymisen kohteeksi. Lapsi ehkä kuulee porraskäytävästä vaimeaa ääntä tai varvasta kutittaa, tai ilmassa leijuu haju, jota hän ei vielä tunnista. Ja niin pienet, koko ajan pesusienen lailla uutta imevät aivot jäävät hetkeksi ihmettelemään. It's happening again. Where did you go, Lucas? You sit in the high chair and suddenly your energetic little body seems to forget what's going on. Your eyes stop looking for familiar objects. Your head stops turning. The perpetual motion machine of your fingers stops reaching for the sippy cup, the spoon, the edge of your bib. I wave my hand in your field of vision. No, you don't react. I clap my hands, but you don't snap away. Don't even turn to look in the direction of the sound. Where do you disappear to, little one? There, now you're back again swinging your legs, squinting your eyes. And when I grin at you, you grin back and slap the rail of the high chair excitedly with your oatmeal hands. I take a deep breath, calm down. After all, it could just be the attention of the child with senses that are constantly developing, suddenly fastening on something that an adult can't even guess and focusing on it. Maybe he hears a faint sound from the stairwell or maybe his toe tickles or There's a scent in the air he doesn't yet recognize, his little brain always absorbing something new and pausing for a second to wonder at it. Sissy did something similar when she was Lucas's age, or was it later? I'm not sure. I remember once anyway, I think I was pregnant with Lucas and I was sitting on the sofa lost in my thoughts, probably reading the paper. And suddenly I felt like somebody was watching me. And when I turned my head, I saw Sissy. She had got up from her nap without making a sound. She was standing in the doorway of her room looking at me, but I was sure that she wasn't seeing me. She was someplace else, so deeply absent that she could have been in orbit around the moon, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of ice cold emptiness between us. She was stopped mid stride, her mouth half open as if she was about to say something. And I had to blink a few times because the illusion that I was watching a video freeze frame was so perfect. Like when I'm watching Netflix and Essie unexpectedly hits the pause button and says she needs to pee. I didn't know what to do. A weird shiver went down my spine, like there was a third person in the room with us, some entity that had stopped time. I remember I looked instinctively at Essie's father's armchair. And for a second, I saw a dim form there but it was probably just the weak light from the lamp playing over the worn cushions. Then Sissy moved, the video started up again, the foot took its step and she said, can I, just as if she really had been on pause and was continuing without a break at the exact place and time where she left off before that few seconds pause. At the time I thought for quite a while about whether I should tell Essie that her daughter sometimes goes away somewhere Okay, so that's, that's the reading from uh, Strangers Inside, and, and this is my own translation. So 
next, let's talk with, uh, last but not least, Rosa Lixum. Uh, Rosa Lixum is a visual artist, photographer, and filmmaker, as well as an author of poetic, gritty, and realistic novels and short stories that focus on unconventional characters and sometimes disturbing revelations. Her work is famous for its inventive use, inventive use of non-standard language and representations of non-standard, hard to categorize people. Her books are often funny and sometimes horrifying, books that find beauty in the ugliest places. And she has been awarded the Finlandia Prize and the Nordic Council Literature Prize for her work. So hello, Rosa. Hello. I need to see you on my screen. There you are. Can't you see me? <laughs> I'm <now>. here. <laughs> so today uh, we'll be talking about uh, compartment number six, uh, one of two novels that you've had published in English, uh, as well as numerous short stories uh, published in English, for which you write a lot of. Uh, compartment number six was published by Grey Wolf Press in the United States and by Serpent's Tale in Britain. So this book is about a time and place that fascinates me and many other people. It's uh, set in the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And it's about a train journey across Russia. And this is a trip that you took yourself when you were in the USSR around the same time. Uh, how did that experience inspire this book? And, and why did you come to write about it so many years later? Um, uh, when I had that uh, uh, trip on a, a Trans-Siberian train, it was a very special trip because I really, uh, in reality, I traveled together with a man who uh, is like the person Vadim in this novel. Uh, the whole trip was uh, very furious. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it took uh, 25 years before I wrote about it. But after the trip, uh, it took uh, two months. So I was sure one day I will write about this. But it took very, very long time. Did you keep a journal while you were traveling to help you uh, write the book later? Yeah, of course I kept a diary, but uh, I uh, didn't even uh, look at it. Uh, uh, I, I made the book in another way. So, uh -huh. uh, so uh, I made this, um, uh, how to say, uh, studies for two, three years before I started to write uh, this novel. Just research. Maybe three years, yeah, research, yes. Mm -hmm. So the book is focused very sharply on two people who are stuck together in a train compartment for a very long journey. Uh, a very quiet young woman from Finland and a loud, hard drinking uh, Russian man. And the book feels uh, to me uh, like almost like an allegory for the relationship between Finland and Russia or between perhaps any small country and it's and a much more powerful neighbor. Did you think of that as you were writing uh, that these characters could be sort of symbols uh, for their the countries where they come from? Not at the first place, but uh, during this um, uh, writing process. So I really began to think that the lady, the young lady, is a Finland like Finland and the. And the Vadim, this burlesque Vadim, is uh, is Russia, and and the time uh, is uh, during the Cold War. Or, so the book describes uh, uh, relations between Finland and Russia during the Cold War. And it's at a time also when um, USSR is breaking down, and the train itself keeps breaking down as well. And they have many adventures uh, when the train won't run and they need to spend time in the cities that they visit. Uh, so let's, let's just go ahead and, and read, shall we? Okay. So uh, this is the Finnish version of the book. 
<laughs> okay, anyway, and so I will read um, the very beginning of this book. Moskova painautui maaliskuun kuivassa pakkasillassa kyyryyn, suojeli itseään jäisen punaisena laskevan auringon kosketukselta. Tyttö nousi junan häntäpään viimeiseen makuvaunuun, etsi hyttiään, hyttiä numero kuusi, ja hengitti syvään. Hytissä oli neljä vuodetta. Niistä ylimmät oli nostettu seinälle, sänkyjen välissä oli pieni pöytä, Pöydällä valkoinen liina ja muovinen kukkamaljakko, siinä ajan haallistama vaaleanpunainen paperineilikka. Sänkyjen päädyn hylly oli täynnä isoja, huterasti sidottuja kolleja. And now in English. <laughs> now in English. <laughs> Moscow hunkered down into a dry, frozen March evening, sheltering itself from the touch of an icy sun setting red. The girl boarded the last sleeping car at the tail end of the train, found her cabin, compartment number six, and took a deep breath. There were four bunks, the higher two folded against the wall above. There was a small table between the beds with a white tablecloth and a faded pink paper, paper carnation in a plastic vase. The shelf at the head of the beds was full of large, clumsily tied parcels. She shoved the unprepared prepossessing old suitcase that Zahar had given her into the metal storage space under the hard, narrow bunk and threw her small backpack on the bed. When the station bell rang for the first time, she went to stand at the window in the passageway. She breathed in the smell of the train, iron, coal dust, smells left by dozens of cities and thousands of people. Travelers and the people with them pushed past her, lugging bags and packages. She touched the cold window and looked at the platform. This train would take her to villages of exiles across the open and closed cities of Siberia to the capital of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar. When the station bell rang the second time, she saw a muscular cauliflower eared man in a black working man's quilted jacket and a white ermine hat. And with him, a beautiful dark haired woman and her teenage son keeping close to his mother. The woman and the boy said goodbye to the man and walked arm in arm back toward the station. The man stared at the ground, turned his back to the icy wind, pinched a bella morca, lifted it to his lips and lit it, smoked greedily for a moment, stubbed the cigarette out on the sole of his shoe and stood there shivering. When the station bell rang for the third time, he jumped on the train. The girl watched him walk toward the back of the car with swinging steps and hoped he wasn't coming to her compartment. She hoped in vain. After a moment's hesitation, she went into the cabin and sat on her own bunk across from the man who radiated cold. Both were silent. The man stared sullenly at the girl, the girl at the paper carnations, uncertain. As the train jerked into motion, Shostakovich's eighth string quartet burst forth from plastic loudspeakers in the cabin and passageway. And so the Moscow winter, the steel blue city warmed by the evening sun, is left behind. Moscow, the city lights and the noise of traffic, the circle dance of churches, the teenage boy and the beautiful dark haired woman with one side of her face swollen are all left, are all left behind. The sparse neon signs against a morose pitch black sky, the ruby red stars on the towers of the Kremlin, the waxed bodies of the good linen and the bad Stalin. The ring roads and the metro circle line, Stalin's thoroughfares, the western style multi-lane, Novi Arbat, the Yaroslav Highway and the rows of dachas embellished with carved wooden flourishes. The slack, weary, overworked land is left behind. An empty freight train, a hundred meters long, zooms by the outside the window. So that is the beginning of compartment number six. And uh, now we can all talk together uh, about, <clears throat> about Finnish literature generally uh, as much as possible. And uh, since this is a Nordic literature series, I thought maybe we could just begin uh, by talking about Finland's particular place in Nordic literature. How do you think Finnish literature differs uh, from the literature of other Nordic countries? Anyone? 
uh, uh, no, I can say that uh, it uh, differs uh, at least one way. And uh, it's uh, because during the last 50 years in Finland ha have been published so many books uh, about war, war novels. And the reason is obvious. <laughs> um, Finland took very active part in, uh, uh, in Second uh, World War. And also during the uh, last 10 years, a uh, um, lot of uh, wartime novels uh, have been written by female authors, like me also. <laughs> That's something new. <laughs> Okay, I, I could also have a word about that. Um, I mean, of course, uh, we have in in uh, Finland we have some uh, very technical differences uh, when you compare our literature to other Scandinavian Scandinavian countries. For example, that we are very small language, uh, very few uh, Finnish native speakers, about 5 million, and our language is very difficult, uh, very different from, from the other Scandinavian languages. So uh, we are kind of, uh, uh, we, we have uh, kind of, uh, the, the, uh, to we, have, we are very different to start with, uh, because of course our language uh, uh, creates a uh, kind of new a unique pers perspective to uh, how to see the world and, and so on. And uh, maybe have very young literary tradition compared to Scan other Scandinavian countries. Uh, let's, let, when you think about that, uh, Finnish has been uh, our official, official language only 150 years. It, it's a very, very young tradition. So uh, of course we don't have that kind of uh, uh, amount of great uh, uh, writers from from the 16th century and so on and so on. And that is true, but what uh, uh, Rosa said that uh, our wars have dominated our literature quite a lot because uh, it, it's not only the Second World War, it's also the Civil War. This kind of uh, like national traumas are are perhaps not dominating, but they are very, very uh, usual team in, in Finnish uh, uh, literature. Yeah, the thing about the languages has also had an effect on um, the number of translations that come out of Finland uh, has been much smaller than other Nordic countries as well. Yeah, that's because uh, it's such a such a rare language, so uh, it's very difficult to get uh, professional uh, translators. Uh, it, it's it's really is uh, something that it, it's a bottleneck for the translation. Yeah. It really is, mm -hmm. and I think Lola has has more specific numbers, but I think in Finland, people translating from Finnish to English, there are maybe only what five people. Well, people who do it as their profession, yeah. <laughs> there are there are more people who occasionally translate from Finnish, but those who do it as a profession, it's it's definitely you know ten or fewer. Yeah, and we are yeah. all lining up for them. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. We're all in line. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I could say also a, a, a bit more about the thinness of of our literary history that. Um, I think there's also some potential there that the, the heaviness of tradition is not so, it's not so heavy on our necks. It, it can also be, it, it can be an opportunity. I think there's a lot more kind of um, ability to move between um, genres, for, in, for instance, that authors can move. Uh, they are not so fixed to one genre. Um, so, uh, I think that is something that um, I can see in Finnish culture, maybe in, in more generally, not just in the, um, not just in literature. Yeah. Um, so it, it can also the the lack of tradition can also 
be there is some potential no, that's, that's in it true. that's true really yes yeah yeah, yeah I, I have uh, noticed that in in the field of speculative fiction for example in those countries that have had uh, have a strong tradition of fantasy and science fiction those two genres have uh, kind of separated but yeah. in finland everyone who is interested in in uh, these genres uh, are writing both or doesn't care yeah. are, are they poor forms of those yeah 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 you you don't get fixed with a kind of label exactly. of yeah yeah no no artificial boundaries many yeah. finnish books are difficult to categorize i mean even just preparing yeah. to talk about you all i don't mm. want to just I, I, ha I want to give people who haven't read your work an idea, but to just say that uh, that it's just speculative fiction or a horror novel or a crime novel, it just doesn't uh, doesn't capture the the way it cross that your work can cross uh, boundaries. So that's interesting, mm. and also um, within the tradition, you know, the sort of tradition of Nordic realism or something out of out of you authors, perhaps Rosa, you are the one who the book we're discussing is somehow in that tradition. Uh, but I, to describe it as merely a realistic uh, novel doesn't do it justice either, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, but in recent years, uh, we were talking about the lack of, or the fewer translations that come uh, from Finnish, but that's really increased uh, dramatically in the past uh, decade. And partly it's because there are more translators available. Also, uh, there's just been interest uh, having to do with uh, really good um, promotion of Finnish literature in Finland. Um, so this is, of course, great for me. <laughs> I'm very happy about it. Uh, but I'm wondering how it how it affects uh, you. Um, some of you have been writing for a long time um, and have had a real increase in, in interest abroad in your work. Uh, uh, particularly in English, but also I think in other countries as well. And I'm wondering what effect that has had on you, uh, whether it's exciting, whether it affects uh, how you write and the audience, uh, does the audience for your books? Oh, I can start. <laughs> I, I can start again. <laughs> no. So my first book uh, was uh, published abroad uh, uh, 1985, so quite a long time ago. And after that, I have been uh, traveling around the world with my books, and prom uh, I, I'm very used to promote my books abroad. Uh, but I have to say that uh, uh, during last uh, five years, even more than before, I really like it. I like to travel. I like to to present my books uh, in literature festival and book fairs, and it's very nice. Uh, it I really enjoy it. Uh, but I think that, that this traveling uh, uh, has not affect uh, on my writing at all. So I have my own style, and I write to try to be better in my own road, and so on. So. Uh, but um, it's very, very necessary for me to to travel around with books. Well, it did increase. The traveling did increase in in the ten years that I've been published abroad. It's it's increased immensely. Every year has been busier than the last, except of course this year, which has been dead. Yes. Um, but has it influenced my writing to having been published abroad? I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question, but I think I've been encouraged by what success I've had in the UK, especially if I think about it. It, it certainly had an effect on me because I was very uncertain when I published my first black humor book because I was so nervous. Will the Brits understand? Will, will will people abroad understand Finnish humor? It's, I mean, it's not like our major export. Um, I mean, so far, uh, but uh, I was nervous, but I was very happy and very grateful when it was successful. And I think it encouraged me to 
at least partly encouraged me to continue with that. So yeah, in that sense, yeah. The fact yeah, that you knew there was an international audience for that. Yeah. 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 I think that uh, this this is the point. What Antti said that we we got some confidence of from the time translations. Um, when I was writing my first book, uh, uh, which is uh, called The Troll, or Not Before Sundown, depends on uh, if it's uh, the British or US edition. Uh, when I was writing it, I thought that this book uh, will never be translated to any language because it's impossible. To translate it, it was it's for, it's so full of Finnish culture and and uh, uh, Finnish uh, inside jokes <laughs> lit, uh, in lit, lit, of literature, and uh, now it's translated into twenty languages. It has won uh, international awards and so on, and uh, it it was kind of a proof for me that uh, for at first uh, uh, everything is trans uh, translatable. Everything is uh, translators. Translators are they are such genial. They they can do everything. It, it's like magic, and uh, uh, so I I just was convinced that uh, it, everything uh, that um, you you write uh, can be understood in in, uh, in different uh, countries and and with different audiences, uh, and. Uh, Things that are very, very Finnish can also be of interest to international readers. Oh, yeah. Celia, you've lived abroad for a long time. Uh, do you have, yeah. I've, I've wondered if when a writer lives abroad for many years, uh, who was your audience in mind when you're writing? Do you think of yourself as writing for Finns or for the people mm -hmm. around you in Britain when you lived there? Or how does that work? Yeah. Well, my, my, my writers, um, life started after I moved back to Finland. So I've, I've spent the years in Britain before that. Uh, I was studying performance there. Um, but um, so I've had a kind of multicultural identity uh, for a long time. And I think it is something that I've always um, somehow been drawn to. Um, I think it is a sort of inner feeling of not quite belonging. And somehow it gets a more concrete form when I'm actually abroad and I don't fit. <laughs> so um, I've always been quite comfortable uh, having one foot somewhere else. And I thought when I, um, writing has always been so bound with Finnish language that I felt like that is the thing that kind of pulls me back here. And um, I was, really really happy that um, from the start with the first book that it happened to be the year when uh, Finland was the um, uh, guest country of Frankfurt Book Fair and I got the German translation and um, kind of had an opening for translations from from the very beginning of my career as a writer and um, so, uh, so it feels good that somehow that the same way that I feel like I have as a person a little bit more space when I'm abroad, I, I feel like my books have a little, definitely more space when they are uh, read abroad. More um, space in, in what way? I think because fin Finland is quite monoculture, um, it's easy to put people in different boxes because it's quite easy to read them how the you know depending on where they live where they um what school they went to it's it, it's um it's easy to know each other so it's also easy to get categorized and somehow it doesn't really go right and then it's quite difficult to get out of those boxes um and um whereas when the book travels it is just a book um People don't know how old I am. Um, um, they know nothing about me. So they just take the book as the book. And I, 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 I often feel like it gets um, yeah, a bit more respect. It's interesting you say that because one of the things I get asked as a translator is uh, often, or just as someone who uh, lives abroad and has spent a lot of time in Finland is, you know, what do people think about Finland in, in Seattle or in the United States? And I mean, sadly, they don't think anything about Finland. 
uh, that's the that's the, uh, the interesting thing. There's really just not much knowledge of Finland uh, in the United States, in particular, and um, and so that in a way is a it's unfortunate, but at the same time, it gives you complete freedom as to how you can present yourself as authors from Finland. And you're not read as authors from Finland. Nobody thinks about where you're from very much. I mean, they do if the book is set in Finland. If it's not set in Finland, they may never even care to think what country this author is from. But um, that that lack of knowledge, uh, I just wondered if that's something you've encountered uh, in interactions with uh, with uh, readers or, or, or publishers in other countries and when, whether you've had like responses to your work uh, that really but, surprised you uh, or uh, for whatever reason. Only well, about noticed... a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of things happened that surprised you? Well, well, as you said, nobody really knows anything about us. That's, that's <laughs> the basic truth of it. <laughs> um, they can't even put us on the map and, but it's, but it's fine because what Celia said, th there's an interesting phenomenon with, with, with the reception of the book. It's, it, it gets, what I've found is that they're actually received as books, but whereas in Finland, they're received as books by me. <clears throat> I'm not, you know, I'm not a household name. I'm not saying that, but you know, if you're <laughs> reading books, then you might've heard my name or, whatever but abroad nobody's heard of me and it, it, it there is a freedom in that and, and and you can i think that that's part of the encouragement that i've gotten from it i think hard to describe but that's really how i feel i i was promoting my um book last year um in several asian countries and again that's really different because um, then I'm a European writer, <laughs> so it's, it, it's totally irrelevant that I come from Finland, but uh, so I'm just European writer. And then, you know, I was asked, that, like in India, could you recommend some European books? <laughs> <laughs> it's like such a bizarre question, but I, I understand it's just as, you know, just as bizarre to ask somebody to recommend some Indian books. <laughs> Actually, the um, only, I was going to ask you, Johanna, the only area of uh, Finnish literature that comes to mind uh, where people are aware of Finland as producing it is in, in speculative fiction. There is some awareness abroad because of uh, the attention that Finnish Weird has got uh, from some publishers. And you've had experience interacting at uh, science fiction conventions and things like that. And so that's a whole different uh, way of interacting with foreign readers. Yeah, that's that's true. It, it's quite uh, quite uh, like a con uh, contained bubble of of audience and uh, this kind of uh, fandom that you, that uh, you uh, are just having uh, everything that is uh, in non realistic vein. Is it literature or movies or uh, TV shows or anything like that? So uh, games. So uh, uh, the, all those people who are in, in those circles, they kind of uh, communicate very uh, much with each other. They have, we have all those international and national meetings and so on. So I, I can say that I have fans uh, in, uh, abroad. And, uh, and uh, of course, all of you have, uh, all, of, all of us in this panel have fans, but, but this kind of, kind, kind of fans that, uh, that really uh, are kind of committed readers who, who want to read uh, uh, everything I write and so on. Um, and uh, what about, uh, and, and I was about, uh, about to comment that this uh, people don't know anything about Finland. Uh, and because I write speculative fiction, some, sometimes happens this kind of uh, situations when, for example, with the, my novel Core of the Sun, uh, in which I have uh, come up with a very dystopian alternate Finland, which is kind of uh, the North Korea of Europe. And everything is very uh, primitive and the um, very, very unequal uh, society and so on. And some 
uh, readers, because they don't know what Finland is really like. <laughs> they have thought that this is kind of, you know, uh, uh, realistic uh, 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 version of, of, uh, of Finland. That, that, uh, like, like, oh, I didn't know that you have this terrible... <laughs> <laughs> that, that terrible police, police, but the political system, or or something. I, I have been so embarrassed. <laughs> You're a dissident author, <laughs> rebelling against the tyranny of the yeah. government. <laughs> so, uh, what about Finnish literature? Uh, I suppose you've already said you've already talked about this uh, about how the, uh, going uh, having readers abroad influences your own work or doesn't influence it. But do you think Finnish literature has changed with its uh, increased sort of uh, visibility uh, among world literature? Do you think uh, writers in general are affected by this uh, increase uh, in translations of Finnish work and increased readerships abroad? I think mm -hmm. at least in one way we've stayed very original, very, very Finnish. Uh, there's been a huge trend in Scandinavian crime fiction over the last maybe, I don't know, 20, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it's never really caught fire in, in, in Finland. I mean, Finland is very resistant. I think, you know, Finnish literature is very resistant to, to, to trends. I mean, we're seeing some thrillers in the Scandinavian crime fiction fashion coming out of Finland now, but it's a very new thing. Uh, so I would say in, in that sense, and speaking as a crime writer, categorized as crime writer, I would say that we stand very much on our own feet, it seems. In that way, at least. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question at all. It was just something I thought. I think it did. I mean, that I mean, crime fiction is a really good example where there's certainly is a widespread awareness that there's a huge uh, market for crime fiction, and in particular, crime fiction in translation. It's one of the kinds of uh, uh, literature that uh, we know that readers actively seek out translated uh, works. They're not just looking for, there's many people, my sister, for example, <laughs> who doesn't just wanna read crime novels, she wants to read translated crime novels. She wants to read crime novel, novels uh, from abroad. And so it's kind of unique in that way. Um, but perhaps, uh, does anyone else have something to say about how they think Finland's literature generally has responded? Okay. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, I think there are I think there are writers who are that that um, quite happy to write just for the Finnish market. Yes. Like uh, they they don't really, you know, that they 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 write for uh, about Finnish world for Finnish readers. And then there are other writers as well. And I uh, um and the and there are also writers who have that international market and those um, qualifications in their mind already. There are also people who nowadays write first in Finnish and then translate themselves into English because they yes. lived for a long time abroad. Yeah. Um, I wonder when it comes to literary fiction, I'm not always sure if, I think there's a lot of potential in Finnish literature um, in literary fiction that would have potential abroad as well. And maybe, um, I'm not always sure that the Finnish publishers recognize correctly where that potential is. Like um, that there are books that have international pop potential, but they don't get a momentum because the Finnish publisher doesn't consider them as such. Um, that's just my personal view. But. Yeah. But it's always this that we have this marketing problem here in mm -hmm. Finland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why quite many of us uh, have uh, this um, uh, agent in uh, Sweden selling our rights. Because uh, 
we are not so uh, uh, used to market our products. <laughs> also about uh, uh, our books. So yeah, Swedes, uh, Swedes are better in, the, in this. It sounds so. It sounds sort of mercenary or something, but marketing your products, you know, that means like having your works translated. It was, it was your... joke. It meant to be a joke. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's true at the same time that you have to have this sort of, um, sort of uh, coldly uh, transactional uh, agent and publisher system, uh, and, and it's very strange when the. The product, the so-called product, is wonderful works of literature, uh, but that's how that's how you can get them uh, to to a larger readership. Anyway, maybe it's time we uh, take some of the some of the viewers or listeners' questions. Kyle, are you there? <laughs> Kyle. Oh, where's... Hi, Kyle. Oh, Are you... Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I had a bunch, and my cat is sitting on me, and he doesn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you sound so relaxed. <laughs> uh, this, is for, this is for Lola. Uh, this person would like to ask um, how she deals with translating from a language with no grammatical genders, such as Finnish, to a language language with grammatical genders such as English. Well, that's fairly straightforward most of the time uh, because I almost always translate uh, cont from contemporary authors, so I can ask them about um, about how to proceed. Uh, uh, nine times out of ten, uh, we can just decide sometimes arbitrarily <laughs> whether a character is a he or a she and use just a natural uh, English way of describing them. Other times it might be important to not mention the gender of the person, um, in which case, you know, it's, it's not so difficult. You just use nouns instead of pronouns, um, leave off subjects if the, uh, if the voice of the, of the text uh, allows it. So, you know, you have workarounds um, I remember translating an entire children's book that didn't specify the gender of the character, a little animal character. And um, so I was able to easily translate a children's book just using the character's name throughout without any pronouns. But then when I sent it to the publisher, they said, oh, no, we've already decided he's a boy. <laughs> 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 this is a question from Jean. Uh, she's wondering what the place, what is the place of the Swedish language literature in Finland is today? <clears throat> are authors still writing in their native Swedish tongue if they are Swedish speakers or are they almost everything is in Finnish? I can tell you that, of course, uh, many uh, Finnish writers write in Swedish and it, there are publishing houses that specialize in books written in Swedish in Finland, and there are prizes for uh, writing in Swedish. Does, do any of the uh, you have anything to add about that? <laughs> okay. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll have a Finnish panel, or sorry, a Swedish panel in November uh, as well. So, uh, do you see any par parallels between the trends in Finnish literature and the trends in Finnish music? That's an interesting question. I wonder what kind of music they're thinking of. Yeah. I can, I, I know that there's a lot of Finnish music that, uh, that has uh, exported really well uh, and more recently. And that's similar to what's been happening with Finnish literature, right. I suppose. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, what is the biggest challenge in the timeline and process of getting your works translated from markets outside of Finland? I think that it was fairly answered earlier. The lack of translation translators, or are there different other challenges as well? 
So can you read the question again? Sure. What is the biggest challenge in the timeline and process of getting your works translated for markets outside of Finland? Okay. So what kind of challenges have you had getting things uh, published abroad? Well, um, I think that the, one of the bottlenecks is uh, that we have had uh, this agent system only just like about uh, 10 years or 15 years. <clears throat> And uh, before that, the publishing houses had their foreign rights departments and, and all the smaller houses couldn't afford to have this kind of service for the writers. So um, we are just like in the learning process in, in uh, how, how to market uh, uh, Finnish literature abroad uh, efficiently. True. Yeah, some some people watching may not realize the the ways in which agent uh, most publishers uh, won't even consider uh, translation unless it's submitted to them by an agent. Mm. And they right. have relationships with literary agents who provide them with information about books uh, that they might want to have translated. So it's a very it's got a long tradition of how how books are acquired. Um, and this is a question for Johanna, but I'm sure the others can answer it as well. Uh, can you explain the term Finnish weird? No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, it actually is a, is a marketing term, uh, kind of umbrella term for everything that is written in fin Finnish and it's not uh, of the realistic tradition. I mean, because we have, we don't have those uh, uh, strong boundaries between different genres uh, that, uh, of speculative fiction. Uh, our writers mix uh, science fiction and fantasy and horror and surrealism and uh, everything uh, in, in perhaps in the same book. Of course, there is all, also uh, very often a, a strong traces of realism. So, uh, we just got uh, fed up to uh, that, that kind of pie pigeonholing that, that you are a fantasy writer, you are a science fiction writer, you are a horror writer. We thought that, okay, we are those people that are writing in Finnish and we are a little bit weird. So that's it. <laughs> uh, this is a good question that uh, the other panelists also liked answering. Um, what have you been reading lately that you really loved? And it doesn't need to be finished literature, whatever. They just want to know what you're reading that you really loved. I'm reading at the moment Virginia Woolf's uh, essays. <laughs> and um, there's a really good new translation um, into Finnish um, of them. And um, it's, uh, um, I think it, I've just reached an age when reading um, letters and essays by other authors has become interesting. <laughs> um, um, and um, it's just really fascinating. It feels really intimate because it, it feels like I get a feeling and, and kind of, yeah, quite a personal feeling of who Virginia Woolf was and how she thinks. Yeah, it's really... I recently read a classic that I was supposed to read over 30 years ago, uh, Bulgakov's uh, Master and Margarita. Mm. That was a wonderful novel. Mm. Everybody's read it when they're 20. I read it when I'm my age. <laughs> <laughs> I have been reading um, Jenny Erpenpick. So she comes from East Germany and um, I really like her books. Very, very good um, author. What about you, what about, what about you, Lola? What have you been what reading? You? Anything? Uh, let me think. I recently read a book I really loved, and now it's I'm drawing a complete blank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it was uh, it was a uh, trust exercise. Uh, a, a contemporary novel by uh, Susan Choi. Okay. It's a coming of age novel and I, I liked it very much. <laughs> uh, 
I think that's it for the questions from the uh, the audience. Uh, well, I just would like to thank everyone for participating. It was very illuminating, um, very enjoyable. Um, we do have a Nordic book club that we meet every other Tuesday, and we will be reading on November 3rd, uh, Palm Beach, Finland uh, by Auntie. Uh, and hopefully we can use this as a distraction uh, since we all know what November 3rd is uh, in the it's US. A complete distraction. <laughs> <laughs> So that is a virtual that is a virtual book club right now. So you just need to have a Zoom account and you can join us and discuss Auntie's book. And on the 20th of October, we're, we're reading the Norwegian novelist, uh, the Bell, uh, Lars Mutin's The Bell in the Lake. Um, so please do vis uh, visit the website, scandinavias.org for everything that we have to offer. And next week, and our um, authors, you should know, we are going to the Faroe Islands. Um, with three uh, great Faroese authors, uh, and I don't believe any of them have been translated into English or published into English, but they have been translated into English. So, hope uh, so. Hopefully, this will bring some attention to those three wonderful authors as well. So, thank you again, uh, panelists, and thank you for the audience for tuning in. Um, and these uh, sessions are recorded, so if you want to come back and listen to it again, they will be found on our website as well as our YouTube page. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.